One of my favorite assignments as a composer was when I was co-scoring the series Walker Independence for the CW. There was a heist episode in the first season and the producers wanted it to be a bit like Ocean's Eleven, but with a 19th century Western twist because that's the show. It's 1800s Wild West drama adventure. So because it was a really cool episode and assignment, I thought it might be fun and helpful to break down how I came up with the heist theme and also sort of how it evolved from the first scene that it was used in to the final scene it's used in when the heist is in full play and the arrangement really blooms and it becomes lots of fun. So I'm gonna use this video to break it all down, not just the music writing and arrangement, but the music production because I really love how the final piece ended up sounding and a lot of it comes down to engineering and some mixing techniques that we're gonna discuss. Even though we're using instrumentation that works in the classic Western setting, it still sounds modern and crisp, and so we're gonna talk about how I produce the music at that level as well. We've had a number of new people subscribe to the channel, so before we get started, just a heads up of where my experience comes from. I've been producing music for 20 years and composing for film and TV for over a decade now. This channel's basically the free tier of a larger educational platform I created called Modern Media Composer, which I'll talk about later, but if you want some free virtual instruments and more resources like this tutorial, I'll just put a link below the video so you can sign up and check it out. With that out of the way, how do you musically represent an 1800s Western heist? Let's dive in. So this first cue that I've brought up here is the first time that we hear this sort of heist theme in the episode. And just to kind of paint a picture as to what's happening, all the main characters are sort of gathered around a bar and they're trying to think of how to get what they want out of a situation. And they kind of just stumble upon the fact like, well, what if we con these people? What if we can make them think that they're signing away one thing, but actually they're signing away something differently. And so they decide to kind of pursue that idea. And there's sort of like a playfulness to it, but also like a little bit of like a cat and mouse vibe to everything. And so that's what I try to capture in this first iteration of it. There's also some live instrumentation that I've recorded because I'm a guitar player. And there's also some live percussion that I recorded, which I'm gonna show you as we dive in. But just to give you an idea of what you're listening to, that's sort of the basis of this first scene. So I'm going to start by playing it back and then we're going to just sort of dissect it and discuss the different elements that make up the theme and stay tuned because the real important part is when we go on to the next scene and you hear how these sort of fundamental elements really bloom and evolve for the big payoff of the episode when the heist is in full swing. So this is how it's going to start. So that's the first iteration of this theme when it comes in at the beginning of the episode and they're all kind of trying to figure out how are we gonna pull this thing off. And what I like about it is that it's definitely got that playful cat and mouse vibe to it. And so what I wanna point out is that it's actually really, really simple as you can hear. And there's two things that make up the theme. There's the rhythmic guitar and then there's the lead guitar. And then we kind of play around with the arrangement as to who's taking over that thematic material. But what I wanted to do is I wanted to make something where we didn't necessarily need that higher, more distinct theme in there all the time to feel like the heist was happening. So for example, let's start with the guitar that I tracked over here. Thank you. 
So that on its own is pretty identifiable, and the idea was that if there's parts of the episode where people are sort of talking and there's a lot of dialogue, we don't want that higher theme area to get in the way, and also, if we brought in that higher theme every single time that the heist is being discussed or happening, we didn't want it to become too sort of monotonous or fatiguing to the listener. So I have this sort of backing rhythmic guitar here so that we're able to sort of bring that in and we get a lot of leverage out of that for a while and then as scenes evolve we can bring in that other theme which goes like this. And so those two things working together really make it so that we had a lot of space that we can just say, hey, let's lay in the rhythmic guitar over here, and then we'll just wait a minute or two, they're discussing, we can play around with other parts of the arrangement, and then we're gonna lay in the theme over that once it made sense to do so. Another thing that I really wanna point out here that's making this sound the way that it is, is I don't just have those guitar parts, but I'm also using the guitar as a percussion part. So if you check out this, So I'm just kind of doing a muted strum over it and it's helping just sort of pace things along and bubble things along nicely, but I don't leave it at one track. It doesn't sound like a lot of instruments here, but this is one of the things I'm talking about in regards to production quality. What I've actually done is I do this a lot with percussion is I'm going to record it twice and I'm gonna split it left and right. So I'll have one take going to the left, one take going to the right. They're gonna naturally, because these are just muted strums performed live, you're gonna naturally have a little bit of a differentiation between each strum and uh, the delay of the track. And so together, that's gonna sound like this. It's a much nicer sound when you have both of them in stereo. And I wanna point out that I do that not just with those guitar percussion strums, but also I do that with these other percussion elements. So I'm using this library a lot called Swing. It's from Project Sam and I think it's just fantastic. I use it all the time. This has a lot of, especially for this style of scoring where I wanted the percussion and everything to sound very natural since again, this is an 1800s period piece. We've done that same sort of delay of going left and right in the speakers with the shakers. Check this out. Here's one shaker from Swing. It's doing a similar thing to what the guitars are doing. And then here's the other shaker. And they're doing that in opposite speakers again to give you a fuller sound. The next thing that I wanna look at here, just again, we're just sort of setting the scene. And then I want you to hear how all this applies into the next cue where the theme really sort of blossoms, like I said. But if we go over here, we also are adding some layers of claps and snaps. And again, I just can't like emphasize this enough. I'm making sure to pan things differently so that we have a wider stereo spectrum that's being covered for these different elements. And I'm gonna solo all these percussive elements so that you can hear how doing things in stereo like that, doubling things in stereo, it makes such a big difference. But before we do that, I just wanna point out, I do have these snaps here. These are from a library called Smack. This is what they sound like. So they're pretty good, but I've made sure to double them with a live snap, so this is just me. And I know it seems small, but for me personally, I look for any excuse to turn on a real microphone and just record something. I just feel that when you do that, the way that I've recorded the guitar, and the snaps, and you'll hear in the next scene that we have even more stuff, it just adds a level of crispness and humanness to the track that you can't fully get with samples. We can get close, but even something as simple as a snap, if you record it live, it's just gonna add a little extra differentiation and level of detail. So check out what all these tiny little percussive elements sound like together. I'm gonna solo out the snaps, the claps, and the little guitar strum that I played live, and check it out. I hope you're listening with headphones because that's gonna really let you hear what I'm talking about when I say it sounds fuller and a little bit more well-produced. Those are tiny little elements that just sort of help keep the backbone of the track going. And this is what they all sound like together.
Cool, so that's a good opportunity as well just to point out the banjo and the arrangement here. Obviously, a banjo and guitar are gonna work well in a Wild West kind of show. And for this theme, what really works nicely is being able to sort of just play with the octaves of things. Something that you can hear that I'm doing is I am playing it in the guitar and then we're going up the octave in the banjo. And what you'll hear, I think it's, let's see if it's in this track as well. Did you hear at that part how the bass takes over? So it's just sort of like one thematic line that gets sort of passed around the band, so to speak. Starts with the guitar, then the banjo takes over, then the bass takes over. And being able to do that allows the theme, at least in my mind, to really sort of sink in and become thematic. But at the same time, it doesn't become monotonous because we're not repeating it with the same instrument and the same color and the same tone. So just something to think about when creating thematic material like that. The last thing I wanna do before we move on and I show you guys what this actually turns into for the last scene is I'm just gonna go over some quick mixing techniques that I did in the EQ and compression to sort of make this sound as tight as it does. So if I open up my guitar track, check this out. I just have little movements here. I'm just kind of like taking off a little bit of the top end, boosting a little bit of the mids and stuff. But the most important thing to point out is this is going into its own guitar bus. And that's what I personally like to do when tracking all my stuff is I send it to its own bus. And then look at what's happening there. We are going to run it through one of my favorite plugins for or live acoustic instruments that I track in the studio, and that is Oceanway Studios by Universal Audio. It's a really, really cool plugin that basically allows it to sound like it's coming from a room that's not like my studio space, which is a really dead sounding room. I've got a lot of room treatment here, but it instead gives you sort of like those natural room tones that you're gonna get from Oceanway Studios. So I always run, for example, my guitars, my violins, and stuff like that, not MIDI, but the actual live stuff that I track in this room here, I run it through there and it sounds much more full. Let me just give you an idea of what these guitars sound like without it. So here it is bypassed. Cool, so now I'm gonna enable it. For me, it just has so much more body. It almost sounds like I changed guitars or microphones completely. So I really love that and I highly recommend it if you're gonna be tracking in a room like I am, like most composers are. It's not a live room. It's a room that is treated so that you're hearing back your monitors properly. So that's really it. The other elements in here are just really tiny. For example, I've got this solo pizzicato violin from CineSample's Taylor Davis Library. And that's just kind of adding to the percolation a little. Check it out. Right, so at times it sort of hints at the theme. Let me just play it back for you so you can hear all this together. You can hear it sort of poke through, and that's something that I personally like to do is just look for little, small, very detailed sounds that are gonna poke through the mix just to add a little bit more to the arrangement, add a little bit more playfulness to things because that pizzicato violin might be able to hit some different harmonies or different notes that aren't too intrusive to the theme but sort of support the part as a whole. So with that being said, I'm gonna close this down and now we're gonna to go to the main moment where this theme really blooms that happens during the heist. And I want you to hear how we take this sort of like scratch of an idea and we sort of apply it to a much bigger moment. Before we do that though, I'm just gonna pause here really quickly to mention that if you happen to find this content helpful as a musician and composer, I just wanted to let you know that when you subscribe to the channel, it's a huge help. We actually recently found out that about 57% of the people that view this channel regularly aren't subscribed. And doing so allows me to put out more free content for composers and musicians just like this. It's meant to be a resource for you and the future generation of music makers, so please also don't hesitate to ask any questions. 
use the comment section below because I make an effort to eventually get back to every single question or comment and let me know anything you'd like me to add more clarity to. Ultimately, this is your resource. With that being said, let's open up the next scene so that we can listen to how this evolves into the full-blown heist theme for this episode. All right, so here's the main track and it's kind of interesting. This kind of plays like a suite because you're going to hear that we're going to now integrate that theme, but everything about this has sort of been amped up for the main heist moment of the show. And I just want to, I'm going to play it back and just let you listen to how all those different textures we went over in the first cue are really sort of emphasized here. So I think that's a lot of fun. One thing I'll point out is that you can really hear how, again, just like we sort of started in the first cue, basically that main theme is just being passed along to different members of the band. And I really like that. It's a way to sort of keep everything cohesive while at the same time adding differentiation, making the theme really specific and keeping it fun and interesting to listen to. So let's break this down now. How did we get this to sound the way that it does from both a writing and production standpoint? because this is the real meat of that piece of music. And like I said, it does kind of play like a theme, which I think is cool. As you can hear is we're going through different potential emotions for this heist thing. During the middle thing here, things take a little bit of a turn and there's a little bit of tension like. You could just imagine somebody doing something like threading the needle, trying to get through a situation. So it's expressive like that, which I think is really cool. Anyway, what we've done here is we have that guitar part from the first cue. I'm just adding that little sort of like chug in between, giving it a little more rhythm. You can obviously hear the whole piece of music has been sped up as well, but look what I did over here now. So again, if you're listening on headphones, I'm using that same technique of panning. So that main guitar, the first one we played is going to be on the left, and then I'm playing it all an octave higher on the right. It just gives it a fuller sound. Listen to it together. Whereas in the previous cue where everything was a thinner arrangement, we just have the first guitar. So that's number one. Number two is again, I'm using the guitar as a percussive instrument. And another thing I think I should point out is none of this is like really hard to play. It's not like I'm some expert guitar player or anything, but the point of it is you can really accomplish a lot by keeping things simple. That's always my, my thought process. I might layer a lot of sounds together to get it to sound a certain way and sound bold and sort of like powerful from a mixing standpoint. But a lot of the time I'm trying to keep things as simple as possible. So I feel like we accomplished that here and I like this rhythmic guitar. All of these elements together are also doing what I talked about with the other cue where we have some sort of live human performance that plays off of the MIDI and just brings a lot more life into the whole thing. Here's another thing that I'm gonna point out that we've got, I've got my guitar viol. Again, you can tell when I solo it out, I am not great at that instrument. 
but it just adds a little bit more human flavor, a little more imperfection into the track. Let's now sort of listen to the other things that are in here. So obviously we don't just have those percussive elements like the claps and the shakers. We've now added an entire drum set and I want to show you how I've made it sound the way that it does. This is the drum set. So I really like how that sounds for this particular piece of music. It's got a natural tone to it, but at the same time, the way that we're using compression and layering sounds, it's really sharp and tight, and I think it's great. So let me show you how I did that. First things first is I'm using these swing drums. Again, Project Sam's swing is featured heavily in this particular track. I really love it. And I've got the dry and the wet mix sort of customized here. What I like to do typically when I'm making drums with MIDI is I will have a regular drum track, but I will take the MIDI of the snare and put it in its own track. So in this case, what I've done with swing drums, listen, this is everything but the snare. And then right here, I'm gonna unmute the snare from it. Why do I do that? Well, let's go into the snare drum and you can see I want to compress that differently. Over here, I've got a Universal Audio LA-2A compressor and just check out what that's doing in the snare drum. Needle's just moving a little bit. You'll see that once we go to the drum bus, there's a lot more compression, but this allowed me to sort of compress the snare a little bit more before we hit that. Now, here's the thing that I've done that is kind of like a little bit different. Number one, I've got an additional kick drum here. So what I've done is I've added a kick sample from a company called Circle Drum, and they have these really sort of like dead sounding drums here. You can tell they even have a library called Dead, and all I did was just took a single one shot of the kick drum and dropped it in, this is what it sounds like. So that's gonna basically blend with the room tones that are coming out of the swing drum set. So let me just now put that kick drum, the snare drum track, and the swing um, room tone MIDI all playing together this is what that sounds like now. But I actually took it a step further and I do this sometimes where I will combine another drum set in there just to get certain tones. Maybe I want more room tones, which I think is the case in this one. So check this out. I then went to 8DO's Zeus drum kit and I've added that whole kit. Just like I did with the snare um, from the swing kit, I've separated the kick in the Zeus kit like this. And now all of that is feeding into a drum bus. And when I mix drums, I find this to be really, really important due to the fact that people kind of think of drums as individual instruments like kick drum, snare drum, toms, but I actually think of the drum set as one single instrument. And so while I might treat different microphones, room tones, and things like that individually, I always make sure that they're running to their own bus where I can, you know, add my EQ and compression to the drum set as if it was its own single instrument. And that's what I've done right here. If we go in, you can see that I've got my main compressor here, again from Universal Audio, which is this Fairchild. And then I took this, which is kind of like a Pultic EQ, and then I'm just adding some of my own EQ here. So listen to what this all sounds like now with those different layers where I've kind of like selected a la carte the different kick drum and the snare drum and the room tones from the different drum sets. I've used those individually. They all feed into this bus. Here's what it sounds like. So I've heard people say like, oh, if you layer kick drums or you layer different drums and drum rooms, it's gonna sound like too much or too messy. For me, this sounds like a totally natural drum set, but I have more control over the individual elements and it's all MIDI, it's not actually a real player, but I think it sounds pretty darn good. Let me show you what happens when I bypass all of the EQ and compression that's going in to that master drum bus. It 
It just sounds a little bit less tight. I'm gonna enable it again and let you hear it. So there, there's a lot more clarity in that. I feel personally that this drum set and the way that it's been processed really is the backbone now of this track, and it's combined with all those sort of other percussive elements that we had in the original cue that you heard before. So check this out. I'm gonna put that drum set now with the swing percussion and the shakers and the claps and then my live recorded snaps and stuff like that. Let's put all of that in and hear it together so you can really hear how they all sort of work together to create that fun bubbly feeling that I feel this track has. I think it's really cool. And where we just stopped it, you actually hear that the percussion, the elements without the drum set really take over. And having that sort of like backing auxiliary percussion track, it's a great thing to have because when you have changes in the scene, like, you know, maybe somebody is like about to pull off something for the heist and then it falls short, they've got to pull back. So you can pull back the drums just like we've done here and just sort of rest on that auxiliary percussion because it really helps the scene move along. Check it out. I think it works really well. And one last thing I'll say about the percussion before we move on, I not only have those backing tracks that you heard in the first version of this theme, but I also have other sort of like quirky things that I recorded myself of just mouth percussion. So this is gonna look silly, but I basically went like, you know, into a microphone and I made other weird sounds like and like that. And so I'm gonna solo that so you can hear it. So that's all just me at the microphone making silly sounds with my mouth, but they add again a little bit of a human texture and I thought it was pretty cool. I thought it worked out really nicely. So that covers a really big part of the track's audio. As you can see, a lot of these are percussive tracks, but if we go up here, I'm just gonna now show you the bass. So one thing I just want to point out about that, you may have heard me say this in other videos on this channel and stuff, but I think it's really important, is that with the bass, a lot of people think, oh, I just want to boost the low end. But it's actually when you boost the high end, and as you can see, I've done that here, you're getting some of that clicky sound and stuff, and it just adds a little bit more clarity. You're not going to lose the low end, it's still in there, and I've certainly boosted that a little bit, but it's just really important not to neglect the high end when it comes to bass instruments. This goes for kick drums as well. So these are all just important little production and mixing techniques to keep in mind because the truth is is that if you took all of them off, it's gonna sound a lot different. It's gonna hit you a lot different and it might not have that same playfulness and that bubbly feeling that the track has now. Listen to the bass if I take off that EQ. and put it back on. I know it sounds like a small thing, but to me, that's gonna help add to the playfulness and stuff. So those are really like the main parts of this track. It's the drums and percussion, the bass, and then the acoustic guitars. And you can hear how it's like all together, they make a really big difference. The only thing else that I'm adding on there is what I would call ear candy. So for example, we've got the banjo over here. So now listen for that in the mix. So you can definitely hear the banjo cut through, adds to that little Western flavor and stuff. But if you took it out, the track still works. Put it back in. Maybe. 
So for me, those sort of ear candy elements, they're not the kind of thing that if you pulled them out, someone would maybe directly notice. However, when you put them in, I personally feel that they just add a lot more character to the track. So I really hope that you guys have found this helpful. Again, leave a comment below if you have absolutely any questions or just want to let me know what you think of the track in general. If you're not subscribed and you enjoy watching this channel, please hit the subscribe button because doing so allows me to continue putting out free content just like this. If you want to see how I actually score to picture and write cues in real time for professional projects, just check out our website modernmediacomposer.com I hope you'll consider checking out our pro course, Modern Scoring Mastery. I'll put a link below for more info. I really appreciate you sharing your time with me today. I love being able to share all this information with you. And as always, I hope it was helpful.